Moi drodzy towarzysze, my dear comrades of the horrors in the camp, distinguished guests, distinguished visitors to this place, friends. I am but one of those who are still alive. Few who were here in this place almost until the last moment before the liberation. On the 18th of January, my so-called evacuation started, evacuation from this camp, from Auschwitz, and after six and a half days, it ended. It turned out to be the death march for more than every other co-inmates, my fellow inmates. We walked together as a column of 600 people. According to all probability, I will not live to see another jubilee here. This is how it goes. So please forgive me that there will be some emotions in what I'm going to say. Now, this is what I would like to say to tell primarily to my daughter, to my granddaughter who is here in this room, and I would like to thank her for that, to my grandson as well. But I'm mostly after those who are the peers of my daughter and my grandchildren, the younger generations, especially the youngest, those who are even younger than they are. When the World War broke out, I was but a teenager. In the First World War, my father was a soldier, and he was shot into his lungs, and that kept repeating. That was a drama for our family, and it went on and on. My mother hailed from the Polish, Lithuanian, Belarusian borderland. Armies went forth and back. They pillaged, raped, burnt, burned villages, not to leave anything for those who were coming after them. So you could say that I had first-hand experience of war. Nonetheless, even though it was only 20, 25 years apart, those times seemed so distant, like those Polish 19th century uprisings, like the French Revolution. And that was only 20 years away. So when today I meet young people, I perfectly well realize that after 75, if not 80 years, people get somewhat bored. They find war, Shah, Holocaust somewhat of a boring subject, just like genocide. And I actually understand them. That is why I promise to you, the young, that I'm not telling you about my suffering. I'm not telling you about what I experienced, my two death marches, how I finished the war weighing 32 kilo, really on the verge of life. Utterly exhausted. I'm not telling the things that were worst, the worst, the tragedy of the farewells, of parting with the near and dear, when after the selection you see 
and you sense their fate. No, I'm not telling you about that. What I would like to pass to my daughter, to my grandchildren, and to their generations, I would like to tell you something about you yourselves. I see we have among us the President of Austria, Mr. Alexander van der Bellen. Do you remember, Mr. President, when you hosted me and the management of the International Auschwitz Committee, we discussed those days, you used such a phrase, Auschwitz is nicht von Himmel gefallen. Auschwitz did not fall down from the skies. You could say, that's an obvious thing. Absolutely obvious. It did not. This may even seem a hackneyed phrase, quite commonplace perhaps, yet this is a profound shortcut in our thinking. And it helps to understand certain things. Let's use our imagination and our thoughts to get to the early 1930s, to Berlin. We find ourselves in the center of Berlin. Paris Viertel, the Bavarian district, is the name of that district. It's just three stops away from the Tiergarten, the zoo. There is a station of the metro there. There is Barishev Park. And one day, in those early 1930s, you can read an inscription on the benches. Jews must not sit on these benches. You could say, it's unpleasant, it's not fair, it's not right. But after all, there are so many benches around. You can sit somewhere else. Of course you can. In that district, and that was a district that was inhabited by intellectuals, by the intelligentsia, German of Jewish origin. Albert Einstein used to live there. Nelly Sachs, the Nobel Prize winner, a politician and industrialist, Walter Rathenau, who was Minister of Foreign Affairs. There was a swimming pool and over its door an inscription read, Jews are forbidden to enter. You could say, well, pleasant this is not, but there are so many places in Berlin where you can take a bath or swim, so many lakes, canals, it's nearly like Venice. At the same time, you can read somewhere else, Jews must not belong to German singing associations. So what? All right. They want to sing, they want to make music. Let them just meet somewhere else, they will do their singing. All right. What comes up later is an order, really, more of an order than of an inscription. Non-Aryan children must not play with Aryan children, with the German children. All right, they'll play on their own. And then you read, we only sell bread and food to Jews after 5 p.m. Right, less choice, this makes your life harder. But after all, after 5 p.m., you can still do your shopping. Now, I warn you, I warn you, I'm getting used to a thought 
that thought that someone may be excluded becomes mediated into our lives. The thought that somebody can be stigmatized, that someone may be alienated, And that's how it is done, step by step, slowly, people begin to see that this is something normal, both victims and the perpetrators, the witnesses, those whom we in English call bystanders, those who see it become familiar and they become acquainted with that thought, familiar with the idea that the minority that produced Einstein, Nelly Sachs, Henry Heine, Mendelssohn's and many novelists that it is different, that it can be pushed beyond the margin of the society, that they are different people, that they are alien people, that they are the people that carry germs, that cause pandemics. And this now is a horror that's dangerous. This is where what may happen soon takes its origin. And let me tell you, if you consider that, and if we remember the words of Mr. President, power, power that at that time ran slight policy, for example, they met all the claims of workers. The 1st of May was never celebrated. All right, they gave you a day that was free from work. They introduced Kraftir Heute, so a special holiday for workers. They could also fight unemployment. They knew how to play on the dignity of a nation. Germans move up from the shame of the Treaty of Versailles, have your pride back. And that government also saw that people were slowly engulfed by this lack of sensitivity. They ceased to react to evil. And that was the moment when that government could speed up the process of evil. What came later was something that developed immediately. Jews could not get jobs, they could not emigrate, and then quickly Jews would be sent to ghettos, to Kaunas, to Riga, to my ghetto, the Litzmannstadt, the Zwuj ghetto. Most people from there were later sent to Kulmhof, Helmna on the Ner, where they were murdered in lorries with exhaust gases. And the rest will make their way to Auschwitz, where in a very modern world, way and manner, they were murdered with Zyklon B in all those modern gas chambers. And here you see how the words of the president come true. Auschwitz did not fall suddenly from the skies. It was pittering, pattering in all those tiny steps. It was approaching until what happened here behind me did happen. My daughter, my granddaughter, peers of my daughter, peers of my granddaughter, 
you do not have to know the name of Primo Levi. Primo Levi was one of the most famous inmates of this camp. Primo Levi once used that phrase, this happened, which means that it may happen again, which means that it may happen anywhere, anywhere in this world. May I share one personal memory with you? In 1965, I went for a scholarship to the US, to America. And that was the peak, the acme of that battle for human rights, for civil rights, for the Afro-Americans. It was my honor to participate in a march with uh, Martin Luther King from Selma to Montgomery. And then people who learned that I had been an inmate of Auschwitz would ask me, how do you think? It must have been only in Germany, or do you think it could happen somewhere else? And then I told them, it can also happen in your country, in this land, when the civil rights are broken, when people do not obey the laws of minorities, when you do... There is only one way out, only you, if you are capable of defending your constitution, defending your laws and your rights, your democratic order, which is based on the protection of minority rights, only then will you be able to conquer all that evil. My dear, here in Europe, most of us hail from the tradition called Judeo-Christian, both the believers but also the non-believers assume as their civilizational canon the Ten Commandments. My friend, my closest friend, the president of the International Auschwitz Committee, Roman Kent, who spoke here five years ago during the previous jubilee. He couldn't arrive today. He couldn't fly in today. He's frail. He's been sick lately. But he invented the 11th commandment. The 11th commandment that is an experience of the Shah, of the Holocaust, which is the experience of that horrible time of disdain. And that 11th is be not indifferent. Thou shall not be indifferent. And this is what I would like to tell you, my daughter, my grandchildren. I'd like to tell it to the peers of my daughter, my grandchildren, wherever they live, be it Poland, be it Israel, be it America, be it Western Europe, the Eastern Europe. Yes, precisely, the Eastern Europe. It is very important here. Do not be indifferent when you see lies, historical lies. Do not be indifferent.
Do not be indifferent when you see that the past is stretched to fit the current political needs. Do not be indifferent when any minority is discriminated because the essence of democracy is that majority governs, but democracy hinges on the rights of minorities being protected, and they have to be protected. At the same time, do not be indifferent when any power or government infringes all the social compacts that are there, that are already extant. And keep the commandments, 11th, thou shall not be indifferent. Because if you are, you won't even notice when you, when your as will suddenly see an Auschwitz falling down, dropping down from the skies straight on them.